Hello everybody, so I thought I'd just do a little personal diary entry for you now just to tell you all what I'm doing, what I'm up to, um, what I've been up to in the last few days. I'm just kind of um, finishing off really my my quantum gravity calculations for two hydrogen atoms contained in this one centimetre cubed container. And um, yeah, using this sort of thought experiment, I'm seeking to explain the gravity between yeah, two quantum objects, i.e. two atoms. So um, that's quite quite interesting, quite exciting what I'm doing at the moment, I think, in my opinion. I'm going to try and get this properly written up into a research paper because I'm getting a new laptop tomorrow, yet another new laptop. <laughs> and um, yeah, should be should be able to write that up pretty effectively then and turn it into a proper physics paper as opposed to a mere draft paper such as I've been churning out onto academia.edu over the past few years and um, with all the mistakes in it and typos and everything and all that crap in it which um, I don't want it obviously the finished the finished thing the finished paper or article or whatever it's going to be and um, then try to get that submitted to scientific journals since I think I've read some um, enough scientific papers at this point to kind of, well, uh, understand the style that I need to use, understand the sort of references I need to put in there, and um, at least create the convincing facsimile of what counts as proper research, right, in physics. <laughs> and after all, what do researchers do other than that, really? Let's face it, they just like load it with technical terms um, to sound impressive. They just load it with footnotes and references to sound impressive, particularly early stage researchers. Um, yeah, some things never change, I don't think. And a lot of what comes out of it might be incomprehensible gibberish. And I wanted to make my papers um, accessible to everybody, accessible to um, a wider audience and possible for everyone to understand. But mostly, I guess, they have to be understood by experts and they have to sit within a, uh, a perceptual or cognitive frame of reference that researchers are amenable to or that physics professors are amenable to and strikes people as being a workable compromise position for quantum gravity and a workable way of understanding quantum gravity at the, at the <coughs> understanding gravity at the quantum scale and um, I think yeah I, I can do that I think I can lecture on this subject also I don't think I'm such a bad public speaker um, I think with uh, the right, you know, slides, diagrams, etc., which I'm also capable of producing, I think I can, yeah, give some credible insight into quantum gravity. I've also been working on climate change and climate science recently and this coronal heating problem, which I'm convinced actually does have some bearing on climate science and climate change and came across this article put out by Columbia University of all people this morning claiming a completely wrong fact supposedly backed up by NASA research um, <clears throat> that most of the incoming light, they said most of the incoming light um, to the Earth from the Sun is in the form of visible light, whereas that is completely untrue. It is in the form of infrared radiation. And um, I think it was an ESA satellite initially that, um, that demonstrated this fact, an ESA study published um, back in the 1990s at some point. I think it was 1995 or 1996, I can't remember which it is. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a tra it's not very good, that sort of thing. It's really, really bad. It's either dishonest, which is very bad indeed, and, you know, it's a fact of a lack of integrity, a desire to bandwagon and a desire to um, uh, concord with uh, a large cabal of people who are under a wrong you know, labouring under wrong assumptions in science, or is acting out of ignorance, which is, well, just as bad for an academic institution of the pedigree that Columbia University has. And, um, yeah, Science Direct gives you the correct data, the correct, um, yeah, point of data that 51% um, of incoming radiation from the sun is, in fact, in the infrared part of the spectrum. So the, solar, so the sun... Um, emits mostly in the infrared, not mostly in visible light, like this erroneous bit of Columbia research supposedly backed up by NASA data would um, like to assert. So um, this, is, this is where we're at in this, this area of science that's very, very vexing, very, very troubling to a lot of people. Um, there's people out there trying to shut down debate on the climate issue and shut down debate on climate science. Like, why would you want to do that if you're so confident in your own opinion? 
do you see what I mean? It just smacks as being cowardly. It smacks as being uh, deceitful, wrong-headed, fascistic in nature. You know, trying to undermine people's freedom of expression and trying to um, interrupt the course of free inquiry and all these sorts of things, which are dreadful things to do. Whereas um, one upshot of this is we might not have to worry so much about man-made climate change. Um, we may have to worry about all sorts of other terrible things that humanity is doing to the planet, such as soil degradation, habitat loss, deforestation, loss of marine habitats, ocean acidification, possibly from carbon dioxide, yes. That may be causing all sorts of problems, but global warming as such might not be an issue. Do you see what I mean? And it's really, like, I'm not denying that we, as a species, may have a dreadful impact on the environment. I'm not even denying that CO2 emissions may, from, you know, fossil fuel burning may cause environmental devastation. I'm not seeking to deny that even. But um, global warming and climate change as such, I don't think that that is happening. And that's all I really wanted to say on the matter. Um, yeah, I, I don't agree with burning fossil fuels. <laughs> I think that we have far better alternatives in the form of, say, hemp and um, the solar, you know, renewables and so on, wind, tidal, etc. Um, yeah, I think we've got far better alternatives to burning fossil fuels and possibly nuclear even as well. Um, and we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be doing it for the major reason I always thought that we shouldn't be doing it is because of resource security issues that we're more likely to blow up, blow ourselves up with hydrogen bombs over natural gas and oil and things like this than we are to warm the planet, and it sort of um, detracts from the major issue, you know, surrounding uh, the burning of fossil fuels, which is resource security, and um, climate change is kind of like well a triviality and actually a non-issue in science, I'm pretty certain. Um, but it, of course, it gets all the press, it gets all the credit. Um, they are seeking the same things that we want. You know, people who want to establish resource security through renewables and sustainable and sustainability and sustainable sources of fuel and power. And um, yeah, it's it's just troubling. It's just a you know point of bad science, probably, I think. And um, it's something that, you know, science needs to eradicate from its, from its operational structure, so to speak. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited in what I do. I'm very excited um, that I've made, uh, gathered insights into the coronal heating problem via my theory of quantum gravity. It just um, betrays another one of its varying applications, various applications. Um, can be used to understand yeah, why the corona is so hot because there's a huge electron density surrounding the sun um, in the area of its corona which traps the heat you know electrons reflect photons of course so photons you know released from the sun and stuff getting burned up from the background in the corona all the photons released during those processes will um will be getting trapped there in the electron density surrounding the sun to some extent and this causes the sun to be you know millions of degrees centigrade oh sorry the corona to be millions of degrees centigrade whereas the sun's chromosphere is only about eight thousand degrees centigrade and um <clears throat> it's a similar picture with black hole firewalls and so on and so forth and all stars sort of have a sort of miniature firewall surrounding them which we variably call the corona of the sun or the other stars corona or um well, we call it that, you know, the atmosphere, right, of a star is its corona. And, um, yeah, this and quantum gravity is, is clearly an open problem. And I think, you know, and I have thought for many years that it's a, a problem that, that desperately needs to be solved. And um, it'd be a great, great um, boon to physics. It'd be a great improvement on physical science if we could get quantum gravity solved. And it might provide us with insight all over the place. I think I've gleaned some of what that insight might be, and it does yeah have um, implications for climate science as well, and um, yeah it should be out there for these sorts of reasons. So I'm going to try and get that published in the next few months, I guess, and try to finally get my research out there in the proper sphere of mainstream physics, hopefully. But there we go. We can live and hope, can't we?